So I too am a garbage collector writer. And so uh, maybe we could just turn this whole uh, little conference into a garbage collection conference. But uh, so, um, so let me tell you a little bit myself. And Dave uh, actually probably gave all the introduction I really need. But um, I've been practically my entire career in, in technical leadership roles in large companies and small companies. I started out in a large company and rose to in an entrepreneurial business unit to be the technical leader building small talk machines. And then I started companies and spent about 20 years uh, through a series of companies being the, the chief technologist, CTO, VP of technology, different different titles along the way, but having that sort of role in, in smaller companies. Um, and then I went back to big companies. I worked for Microsoft. I worked for Mozilla. So, but all along that way, I've really been focused on the, one of the things, the innovation part of the role. And, uh, you know, we all have to, every day, work incrementally on the tactical things that need to get done to ship the next version of the product and stuff. But time and time again in these uh, organizations, I've seen companies ultimately fail either because they incrementally did that incre incremental development forever until the world changed out from underneath them and they hadn't noticed, and then they're dead, or that they, in fact, have invested in innovation, and then they run into the innovator's dilemma, don't respond in, in, in the proper way, and die. So innovation is really, I, I think, is really important for a technical leader. And organizations at all sizes tend to look towards the person with the title of CTO, chief engineer, chief scientist, as, as the person to say, here is what we need to be thinking about doing in the long run. So the question becomes, how do you do that? I mean, how do you get out there in front of what's going on and, and try to make some progress, get out from being bogged down from the incremental day-to-day -day development stuff? So uh, one way to do that, uh, a quote attributed to Alan Kay is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And so um, what I want to talk about here for the day is kind of what it means to try to invent the future. That's a very amorphous, nebulous thing. Is there any sort of concrete, actionable thing you can do there? And uh, one of the things that's particularly, I, I think this is important to me personally, is that in my career sp has spanned Basically, from vacuum tube computers, I was in high school, they were, the, the vacuum tube computers I was using was already obsolete. I'm not quite that old, but really from vacuum tube computers to writing the, the standard for today's most widely used programming language. Okay, so a huge difference over that. And I can guarantee you we wouldn't have gotten from point A to point B just by incrementally every year I improving what was going on. So, uh, by the way, I, when Dave asked me to talk, one of the things I thought about was, I could talk about here would be life after CTO. <laughs> because, you know, if you're the sort of person who becomes a CTO, particularly if you're a younger person out there, what's, what's your next career move going to be? You know, what, yeah, you're, and what size company you're in and how's that evolve? And it's actually very interesting and complex. But that wasn't what I ended up picking to talk to you today. So we talk about, one of the things we want to talk about when talking about inventing the future, well, inventing the future isn't writing science fiction, right? What's the difference, or say, what's the difference between writing science fiction? You can sit down. And, and describe some imaginary computing device with maybe a brain interface and you know who knows how many levels of AI or something that's uh, in 30 years and what it's going to be like. But what's actionable about that? You know, uh, what, what is it that makes that imaginative so solution real? 
Uh, how are you, how, what could you do today to start working towards that? And so that's really what I want to talk about. What's the actual act of inventing one of these futures like, and how do you go about it? So we mentioned Alan Kay had the quote here. So uh, for those of you, how many of you know what Alan Kay's contribution was? OK. Um, Alan Kay essentially invented the concept of the personal computer. OK. In 1970, he was walking around with this dream that, gee, wouldn't it be cool to have something like this? OK, this, this Dyna book, this thing that anybody, including little kids, could carry around. And it was a computer, and it just augmented everything they did in their daily life. Now, in 1970, the reality of computing was this, OK? And, and, and can anybody identify that machine? Probably not. That's a, that's a PDB-10. That was the dominant research computer, com computer used, machine used for computer science research. It wasn't even necessarily called computer science back then, but all the major universities were used PDP-10s to do their research. So, so this, was, this was the reality of what computing was about. This is Alan Kay's dream at the time. How do you get, right, how do you get from this to that? In particular, what actionable thing could you do in this world to start to create that? Um, by the way, and I mentioned incrementalism, right? So, you know, could you get here by just incremental improvements on that? Well, Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, who built this, you know, spent the next 20, maybe it was 25 years, incrementally improving this concept, these types of computers, making them smaller, faster, what have you until they became irrelevant because people at that point in time actually started to approximate something like this, right? So it's, this is, I mean, you gotta be thinking ahead, right? It's, you can't just incrementally keep doing the same thing. Okay, so, so how did Alan do this? So, so Kay was working in an organization called Xerox Park. You might have heard about it. It was kind of a unique thing that popped up at a certain point in time, had lots of money to do lots of innovative things. But Kay has talked about a specific strategy that was used to essentially invent these personal computer concepts. And he actually has a couple lectures he gave a couple years ago uh, at Stanford to do that, and I'd highly recommend you go listen to those lectures. I'm going to kind of sim simplify out here the basic concept, but, you know, one of the th ways he describes it is, uh, he's got eight steps down here, and I'm not going to go through each of the eight steps, but I'm, I'm going to do the key ones in a moment, but, you know, one of the things he called this is, you want to play Wayne Gretzky's game. Now, Wayne Gretzky is a hockey player, ice hockey, uh, and I, I, think the, I think he was quoted somewhere saying, well, how do you do, he's famous, well, I think world record holders for all sorts of things that they do in hockey, whatever that is. Uh, Dave maybe could tell us. But uh, the, uh, but he means that this, the key was I go to where the puck is going to be rather than where it is, right? And, and so, so it's, how do, you, how do you go to where technology is going to be? So let's go, I'm going to, here's the basics, the basis of what uh, Kay was talking about there. So you take a timeline, he has, if you take a timeline down here, and this is like 30 years or so down here, and you're over here at the beginning where you got your PDP-10, and you have this vision of this diner book up here, and this thing that people are holding in their hands. Uh, you actually have no idea how that thing is going to work, what it can do, what people does with it, what it's put together. I mean, really, at that point, if this is all you have, you, what you have is science fiction, 
right? So how do you take that science fiction view and turn it in, into something actionable? So, um, well, so Kay's approach, or at least as he now describes it in retrospect, is, well, gee, there must be something here today that makes you believe this is going to be possible in this time frame. And it's not going to be linear, because we know these linear steps, uh, these day-to-day -day incremental things aren't going to cause that sort of radical transformation to take place. So he says, well, there must be forces or factors that have an exponential character that's going to get you from here, from where you are today, to the science fiction world up there. And the first step is you try to identify what they are. OK, so in the case of computing systems in 1970, well, Moore's Law was already on the board. Software innovation was happening. So you can imagine drawing an exponential advancement curve you know, over that time period. And he says, OK, so we know there are going to be these exponentials. And um, we know that uh, uh, we don't know what we're going to have out there. But you know, one of the things about these exponentials, if you look at them, you notice is you go out halfway. Uh, so if the y-axis here, if you assume, is something like the uh, technical sophistication of what's going on in the, uh, of the of the um, on the innovation curve, well, you know, 15 years out, actually, you haven't gone up all that far from the beginning because most of the exponential growth is in the last half, right? So we're saying, well, what if instead of trying to imagine what you have in 15 years, imagine what you might have in half that time? So you back off along the exponential until you're halfway, and you're saying. Well, what could we imagine having there? And what you can imagine having there is a computer that's on a desktop that is interactively much like what you might have out there, but it's not the full package. And you can say, well, that's interesting. Be to kind of begin to imagine what that might be like. and. It's not that far up the, if you will, the Moore's Law curve from where you are today. So what could we build today that approximates this halfway solution? Well, gee, you, you can't build, whoops. So you can't, you can't build this nice little box that has a well-developed uh, sense of what the UI is like. Uh, the start, but you can build, you can fit into a room the pieces you need, and you can put the display on the desktop, and you can start experimenting with forms of interaction and stuff. And by doing that, that's where the invention starts. You're saying, oh, sorry, I'm clumsy here. Okay, so you, you're going, so, so the, we can start inventing now. Now that we have this machine here, and we have a vision, we can now start inventing what this midpoint is going to be like. And that's what they did at Xerox Park. Um, and within a small number of years, within, within a decade, so they started by building this thing. They called it the Interim Dynabook, right? It's, they created the Smalltalk programming language and programming environment in which they implemented really pretty much all the modern UI concepts that we know today. They built sm small semi-portable versions to get the experience of what it takes to carry things around. And this collection of stuff is essentially what a Xerox executive uh, mandated that they show to Steve Jobs in like 1979, who then went off and built this stuff and this stuff. And you, you get to the Dynabook, okay? So that's how that path works. 
So um, for another example, something like that, of how you take a long-term vision and an exponential and shoot for it. So here's another example. I don't know if you can read this one. This is the 30-year vision is clean electric vehicles are dominant, are a dominant form of transportation. Okay, that's the, that's the 30 year vision. What's, uh, what's our favorable uh, exponentials? Well, pr price performance of battery technology uh, driven by consumer electronics applications. Uh, and what's, what's a 15 year old goal? Well, there are actually cars. They may not be dominate. They, they, they may not dominate the entire uh, car industry, but they're they're actually successful mass market cars, electric cars of that nature. How do you get to that 15 year view? Well, here's here's a plan. Uh, take a uh, take an OEM sports car chassis and build an electric car out of it and sell it for as much as you possibly can just to understand what an electric car is like. And then from that experience, build a, a, uh, a more conventional car, still at a high price point, but actually get experience with a unified electrical car platform and how do you build them and how do you sell them. And after that succeeds, well, develop a, uh, a, a basically a mid-price car that anybody could, or almost anybody could buy. And uh, if you haven't recognized it by now, that's the Tesla's so-called secret plan for what they did. So, 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 so one, so a couple of years ago, I put together this idea of uh, how you would do an inventing the future workshop. Um, the idea is, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to get people to think longer term, to think about these things. How do you get started doing this? Uh, particularly in organizations which, where everybody most of the time has to be tactical, well, sometimes you have to think long term and strategic. So, um, the idea of, well, let's, let's do this exercise. Let's, let's pretend to be Alan Kay. Let's pretend to be Musk. Let's pretend to be me in my organization and think about projecting out long term is what it means for our organization. And it's, it's really simple, a simple process. And I actually have used this a couple times with some groups of people. Uh, you start out saying, okay, figure out what your, what, your, uh, what your vision is for n years out in the future. And 30 is probably too long for most organizations, but 10 or five is, is, is not a good value. And Right to make it actionable, it has to build on something. So, uh, well, can you identify some some favorable ex, you know exponentials that are going to uh, actually make that possible? If you can't identify anything that's different from the day that's going to get you there, you probably aren't there, and you probably need to pick another vision. But so, can you try to identify those? Now, back off half the distance. What's the midpoint you might do? And then say, okay, what can you do today, given what you have today, to build, to approximate or, or prototype, if you will, that that mid, that midpoint. And uh, so I use this first in a a group. Uh, Singularity University is this organization in California that is promotes people thinking long term and long term innovation and. One of their programs is they bring in uh, every year a, a cohort of people from uh, developing companies around countries around the world and say, uh, okay, you're the future technical leaders in your countries and you're going to bring change to your country. And so we're going to teach you Silicon Valley techniques for innovation and you're going to go back to your countries and be successful. And they, so they had a workshop with one of these group, group cohorts where I came down and I basically ran this exercise through them and stuff. And, you know, what they, the feedback I got from them was, uh, wow, this is really cool because we had these long-term ideas and uh, all the other classes I've been taking here are talking about raising money and how you manage things and stuff, but no one's ever actually told us how to take this, 
this, this vision and start to do something with it other than going out and raising money and finding advisors and doing stuff like that. So, uh, so it seemed to work really well for th th those cohorts of people. So this is, I think this is a tool you might use in your organizations. If you, you, know, you have a group of people you want more long-term thinking, sit them down in an afternoon, go through a process like this, and see what you come up with. A um, couple warnings from doing this. I always give people about, well, it's just, it's, it's just an exercise, you know. Do, actually doing this for real and, and implementing it is, it's gonna take a lot of work. You know, you, you aren't gonna get it done in an afternoon. Uh, and, and it really isn't about, you know, thinking about the day-to-day, -day, what you're gonna do. It's, it's getting that, vis that actionable vision out there so that you can then intentionally decide whether or not you're gonna invest resources in trying to get there. Um, and, and another thing is, you know, what, what the Xerox Park folks did, it wasn't cheap, right? If you're using today's technology to brute force an approximation of what you might have as a mass market product 10 years in the future, uh, that's, that's not going to be cheap. It, it may be technically possible to do, but it's, so, you know, funding, exactly how do you fund this uh, is a question. And then the big thing is, uh, yeah, I already mentioned this, but 30 years is not gonna work for most organizations. Most organizations don't have a lifetime of 30 years and stuff, but so you need to pick a time horizon that's ap appropriate for yours. So um, that's, re that's really what, was my goal here for the day was to kind of get you thinking about ways you, you know, a tool you might apply on the innovation side of your jobs. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave up here as we got a couple minutes to talk and answer any questions, but if you're interested in any of the more details, and I, I'd really recommend uh, listening to Kay's two uh, lectures to get his, you know, his version of the story.